Welcome to Fashion Reverie Talks. I am Tiana Ibrahimovic. And I am Cicely Daniels. Fashion Reverie takes you from the front lines of fashion to the front row. All of Fashion Reverie Talks segments are based on published content found on fashionreverie.com. So remember, if you want more information on the segments, go to fashionreverie.com. In this episode of season three, we are fortunate to have Halston's new creative director, Ken Downing, and some pre-Bridal Week coverage from Editor-in-Chief William Gooch. So we start every episode with fashion news, and all of our news segments are based on the fashion news alerts found on fashionreverie.com. Okay, so let's jump into the current events in fashion. We're going to start with Cher and the Man Show. Um, and Cicely will deliver those news. <laughs> well, um, it was an event of, like an event of events. Um, obviously, Cher is an event in and of herself, as is the Bauman Show. And this week, it was like, heightened, heightened, heightened. Um, it opened actually with Cher in a video clip. And then later at the end of the show, to the surprise of the audience, Cher appeared on the runway with Batman creative director Olivier Roosting. And um, it was apparently gorgeous and stunning. And um, the show itself had over a hundred looks um, with uh, warm colors predominating, body contouring dresses, all these different knitwear, braided fabrics, emboss leather, all of this design. And um, apparently it was like the event. Um, and it's really interesting as we watch, um, you know, uh, Roosting as the creative director, like really put his stamp onto Bauman, which he has been um, at the helm of for over a decade, so. I mean, anything that involves Cher. <laughs> right? Fashion, I okay. mean. <laughs> I was like, any, any place shares, if Cher's there, I'd go. If Cher's wearing it, I want to wear it. Like, it's, you know, like, she's what, she is such an icon. She's such a fashion icon and, you know, uh, like, a celebrity, but who truly embodies, like, style and glamour and fashion. And so, you know, like, what a, what a, what an event. I, I wish I was there next time. <laughs> Time next time. I mean, I also loved what she was wearing. Usually, Cher can be even more over the top, but this was kind of great fitting. <laughs> I mean, great. but I mean, and also she looks like amazing. I'm like, come on, girl, come on, like just like goals, goals, share goals, goals, just share, share goals. If that's not a hashtag, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there is more shaking and moving in the fashion industry. Uh, we are all familiar with Ricardo Tisci. Um, and so it looks like he will be changing his career path yet again. He will be leaving um, Burberry. He is known for reimagining and updating Burberry's logo, and he eliminated the use of fur from the mm -hmm. iconic British fashion house. Um, the uh, Burberry men's frag fragrance went viral. Um, I know he's very good friends with Kardashians too, so he's kind of uh, a kind of. Um, gotten into a lot of different uh, areas of fashion and celebrity, et cetera. But it looks like he will be uh, replaced as creative director at Burberry by Daniel Lee. Um, and so, you know, he, uh, he had to deal with Brexit crisis as well as the COVID pandemic. So maybe, maybe that's what like made him make, make some new moves. Mm -hmm. But we'll also see what happens with the new creative uh, director, so. I, right, I'm sure that Daniel Lee will do well and I'm sure we'll get some new news. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as someone who was the former creative director of Bottega Veneta, I think um, it's a good match. I yeah. think it's a good transition, so. Ab absolutely. Um, our last bit of news that we're gonna talk about is, um, about LVMH and um, as we all know the uh, inflation is a really big concern and apparently they are going to be offering a bonus package to help their staffers with the rising cost of inflation and um, they uh, kind of are following the lead of Air France and Stellantis and um, they're going to be offering bonuses to about 27 
thousand staffers of between 1,000 and 1,500 euros, which is like 973 ish to 1400 ish dollars, you know, for us to understand. And that's like a, that's a nice thing. So I wonder if any of the US companies are going to take heed or see what they can do because, you know, like inflation is about to hit all of us. <laughs> so I guess I applaud. Did nobody hit us? I'm sorry. My <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Inflation is here. So, you know, um, what a great example, uh, along with President Joe Biden and whatever will be happening in our country. So we'll see if any other um, any other giants in the industry make a big move. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. As long as my closet kind of remains still stuffed with all different things and, you know, <laughs> I can reinvent my looks. I'll survive. <laughs> that's what you'll survive. Well, that's it for our fashion news alert for this week. But if you want to keep up with the stories, you know where to go, fashionreverie.com. So viewers, we have a super special treat today. We have Ken Downing, creative director of Halston today with us. Uh, if you are in the fashion industry and if you love fashion, you have to be familiar with Ken and his high and super creative energy. Ken, welcome to Fashion Reverie Talks. Tiana, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I am so excited to ask you these few questions for our viewers. <laughs> I, I'm excited I like to give you an idea. answer. I, if, I, if I don't know the answer, I think I'll make something up just for the fun of it. No, no, I have answers, <laughs> I have answers for you. <laughs> I love seeing you around New York Fashion Week, around New York events, um, you know, as, as someone who's had so many important positions in fashion. Um, I am curious, how did you first get your feet wet, sort of speak, in the fashion industry? You, you know, it, it's it's interesting. I don't really think I had a choice other than going into fashion. I was interested in clothes from a very, very, very young age. In fact, my, my mother tells the story that I selected a, an evening gown, shoes, gloves, and bag for her at six years old. And she ended up wearing it because she didn't feel like finding something to wear herself in her own closet. And she received so many compliments on it. I was her fashion director at a very young age going forward. You know, the. It's interesting for me because I remember that I had toys, but I don't really remember being surrounded with toys because I was so much more obsessed with clothes and how people dressed. I liked going to weddings and the pomp and circumstance. I loved going to church because I liked to see how people would dress up to go to mass. And it was just something that was very intrinsic in my eyes, seeing how people put themselves together. And so I always knew that I wanted to be in an industry where people were going to be dressed up and, and always changing with style. And so from a very, very early age, everything that I did and every job that I took was really kind of focused on that idea. So I started in the in a, doing window displays in a store that was kind of a, an off price. I think it was called Payless or something. And they let really? me choose the clothes and comb the wigs and hang leaves out of the ceiling. And what if it was fall and flowers growing up out of the ground if it was spring? Um, any opportunity to work around clothes or with clothes I did. So I really started you know, kind of in the in the visual department of a store where I grew up in, in Seahurst, Washington. And, and from there, you know, I was actually <clears throat> discovered on the streets of Seattle. I modeled for some time when I was very young and, and much more, much prettier as a young boy than as I am now as an older man, but um, anything- I mean, you're like, always the most dapper looking person um, on any you're red so carpet. sweet, <laughs> thank you. No, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you find yourself in the world of modeling and people are doing your hair and, and, and they say grooming, but they're really doing your makeup and putting the clothes and things together for you. I really never liked anybody telling me what to wear and, and, how, and how to behave and how to look. So I realized that maybe it would be smarter for me to actually be on the other side of the camera and do just that. So I started doing a lot of styling and, and doing hair and makeup and creative direction for photography, um, which was also a, a real bonus in helping guide me to my career into the fashion industry. My, my big break was really 
when I left FIT here in New York going to fashion school, studying fashion design, I'd gone back to Seattle for a moment and there was a very fine store, iMagnon, which is unfortunately no longer in business, but kind of the Bergdorf Goodman, if you will, of the West Coast. Okay. And a friend of mine said, oh, you should come there hiring freelance. And so I came and I got a freelance job. And after three days, they hired me full time and they let my friend go. Um, I guess that I had a lot of time. <laughs> I was actually on my way back to Seattle. I mean, on my way back, back, to, back to New York from Seattle. And I, and I ended up getting this great job, working in retail, doing windows, dressing mannequins, creating store interiors. And Rosemary Bravo, who we all know in the industry that also worked at Burberry, and she was the CEO of Saks Fifth Avenue. She found me at a very, very young age and brought me to San Francisco and, and the rest is history. So I, I owe a great debt. Um, one to my friend who introduced me to the world of retail that um, she's now a very prominent jewelry designer and, and certainly Rosemary Bravo that saw that I had talent. So it's really how it got started. Oh, that's amazing. And so for over two decades, you were the senior vice president and creative director of Neiman Marcus. I mean, that's uh, impressive. Uh, what do you feel were some of your biggest accomplishments there? You don't have enough time in the day, and, and, not that, and, and not that not that they're necessarily all my accomplishments, because I, I worked with amazing teams, and I, I actually was found by Neiman Marcus in San Francisco working for iMagnon, and at the time I had this I had the ability and the talent to take the mannequins in the store windows and make them look like the models that were actually wearing the outfit on the runway. And a lot of that was through recreating the exact hairstyle or having the ability to somewhat mimic the pose to how they would walk and pose on the runway. And so a lot of the designers that would come and visit us in San Francisco, they were very intrigued and it also became this reputation that I had that this young man in San Francisco could recreate a woman in freeze pose to actually look like the real model. So Neiman Marcus was paying a lot of attention to what I was doing in San Francisco and ended up stealing me away and putting them, <clears throat> putting me in their store in Los Angeles to kind of reinvent the brand through events, the windows, the interiors, which I ended up doing and, and it was really the first time that I had had the opportunity to reinvent a brand, reinvent the image of a single store, and, and I loved every minute of it. But doing so, I found you have to be irreverent. You know, you sometimes have to break the rules, and you can't really do everything as you're <clears throat> rolled out to do, because you know, every organization has their code and DNA of how they want things done, I had a tendency to usually throw the codes and the DNA aside and reinvent. You have to do that when you're reinventing. Um, so because I broke all the rules, it became one of the most important stores in the chain. Everybody loved coming to the store because it looked different. The parties were different. Carl Lagerfeld designed our Christmas and our Christmas windows and created a capsule collection at the time. Every major designer from Johnny Versace to Emmanuel Angaro, Christian Lacroix, uh, name any of them would come to the store and do events. It really became kind of the fashion hub of the West Coast. And so Neiman Marcus brought me to Dallas, a little kicking and screaming. I was, I was a little in <laughs> shock leaving Los Angeles to go to Dallas, I have to say. Um, though I ended up loving Dallas greatly and lived there for over 20, 25 years. But I think some of my greatest accomplishments probably really center around the consumer, the customer. You know, I loved not only being the fashion director and the creative director, but really thinking about not only women individually, but the women and the men kind of around the country that were our consumers, either in store or online, what could I find for them that I would know they would want and what they didn't realize they wanted yet? And being able to anticipate the dreams and the desire of the consumer was something that I, I was really proud that I had the ability to do and forecast trend before trend would happen. 
And even to this day in my role at Halston, you know, you, you have to be ahead of the curve. Uh, you certainly can't be waiting and, and, and following, but the, the ability to really anticipate where fashion was going before it went there. And I think a lot of that is when you know about fashion and you know the art history, the art of <clears throat> fashion, where fashion has been, you really can say to yourself, this is, this is the zeitgeist of the moment. And then you can anticipate where that zeitgeist is going to, to head next. And my ability to do events in stores because I was interacting with the consumer face-to-face -face in dressing rooms and on the selling floor. And the voice of the customer it's super valuable. You know, a lot of people, <clears throat> they create in a vacuum. They, they don't think about the end user. And I'm always, I'm always anticipating what they want next, but I can't anticipate if I don't have their, their voices in my ear, letting me know kind of what they're interested in. So that's, so that, that's kind your of what, magic. What find. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been exactly two months to the day that you're into your new role as a creative director of the iconic American brand, Halston. Congratulations. Thank you I very much. I'm excited to see what do you hope to bring to the brand in this evolutionary moment? You, you know, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting moment and it's certainly a very exciting brand and always has been. You know, just, just a little piece of the past for anyone who doesn't know the Holston legacy. You know, he really liberated women when he was beginning to design clothes. And you know, he started as a milliner at Bergdorf Goodman. He's very known for the pillbox hat that Jackie Kennedy wore at the inauguration of her husband, um, John F. Kennedy. But he knew as women were getting more into big hair styles and not wearing hats and gloves that he wanted to pivot his career and started creating clothes. And at the time that he was creating clothes, they were, they were very stiff and fabrics were very chunky and they didn't allow women to express themselves and didn't allow their bodies to move and express themselves. And so he really liberated women as women were being liberated socially as well in the late 60s and early 70s. And the other thing that I think is so remarkable about an individual like Halston, and it's something we take for granted today, he really opened the first designer boutique here in New York up on Madison Avenue. Now listen, we can walk down any city sidewalk and fall into as many designer boutiques as you can into a Starbucks because they're just everywhere on every street corner. But we have to remember 40, 50 years ago, that didn't exist. There was a, a Halston designer boutique in New York and two years prior, Mr. Saint Laurent, Yves Saint Laurent himself actually had opened his Rive Gauche boutique in Paris two years prior to that. So the idea that he was actually bringing the designer clothes to the consumer in much more of a, if you will, mass way was really quite unheard of. So th the great thing when you take on a brand that the DNA is not only the sensuality of making women look beautiful, also glamour woven through everything that he did. And I think that's super important because today, I'm not always necessarily sure if glamour is at the top of the list when people are thinking about clothes. I often think that in our era of Instagram and TikTok, it becomes sensationalizing something so that it gets a lot of likes or people are following it on TikTok. But well, you have to remember there's a body under those clothes. And, and does that body look great? Does the woman, the man wearing those clothes feel great? Because when you feel good, you look good. And is there just a little bit of glamour? Because I think glamour never goes out of style. And so the idea of glamour will be a, a very, very important part of what we do as we continue to redefine the next generation of what Halston will be. And, you know, I think many designers believe that it's only about a young customer and Halston's very multi-generational. There are women that still have Halston's in their closets today. And I, I hear stories, oh, I gave my Halston that I had to my daughter to wear to the rehearsal dinner at her wedding, or my daughter wore my Halston to her prom. I, I love that people cherish not only the clothes, but they're creating memories with what they wore. And so I wanna bring clothes to those women that remember how grand Halston was, but also bring clothes and, and experiences to an entire generation that may only know him from the Netflix series. And, and I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite fortunate that 
that Netflix series really puts the Halston name back out into the stratosphere. Um, a lot of people think that I resemble him, though I really don't. Um, they, there, there, there is a, there is a love of of the women that he dressed, and and there's a love of bringing beautiful clothes to women and a beautiful lifestyle that that he and I share that that same sentiment. So, we've actually just finished creating fall 2023. Because you know, we work very far in advance, so sooner sooner than not, there will be Ken Downing influenced Halston available for the customer to purchase. So I'm super excited. And you know, we also we have our other collection, H Halston, which is on HSN. I've already been starting doing HSN because this whole idea of not only television to sell, but also live streaming events are very much an important part of what we do because we believe in live streaming and, you know, bringing, bringing beautiful clothes to the consumer wherever they are. That's amazing. And I'm excited to see the next collection coming up. <laughs> you are going to love it. You know, even, even amongst the design room, my, my designers are all, I want to wear this. I'm like, you should want to wear it. We, we have to love what we do. You have to love it so much that you want to wear it yourself and um there's also men's that will be coming very soon also oh wow. yes. and, and you know i i'm not going to say it's going to be gender fluid necessarily there will there will be sizing appropriate but there will be ideas that cross over in both collections i i think that especially when we look at the world today um glamour is not only for women men want men men have their own moment that they want to be they want to be glamorous as well there's there's a little bit of peacock in all of us and <laughs> and, and, I, and i truly believe at the end of the day you know does does a sequin know it no no gender no it does not you know did, is, is chiffon only for women no so and, and leathers for everyone and the idea of beautiful creamy cashmere is for everyone so you're you're going to see clothes that kind of cr cross the boundaries but will look great on on everybody awesome how exciting wow very exciting um now let's kind of you know close the interview with something that's close to your heart um you're the co-chair of the Delivering Good Gala, which takes place in about a month. Um, I actually attended one of those and you hosted it and it was super fun. You made it really exciting. I loved how you dressed all the uh, participants. It was, it, I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen um, this year. So let's talk a little bit about it. Tell us, our viewers, what to expect. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for the lovely compliment about the event last year. You know, we were coming out of COVID at that time or what, what, one of our coming out of COVID moments, I feel like we've had three or four or five coming out yes, of COVID moments, yes. um, but we, we were coming out of a COVID moment when people were beginning to feel comfortable to come back together again and, and all be celebratory um, in, in, in real time. And it was, it was wonderful to create an experience that brought so much, not only joy and, and festivity to the audience, but be able to raise significant monies that we were able to really give back to communities that we support. You know, the, the, I, I'm very, very passionate about the organization Delivering Good. People always say, well, what do they do? What do they do? It, it's, it's truly simple. We deliver good. We, we are an industry um, organization. We collect unused, not only men's fashion, women's fashion, handbags, children's clothes, beds, mattresses, furniture, um, toiletries, and, and we bring them to people who are either finding themselves in the middle of a catastrophe, like we're seeing right now in Florida, or helping people from the south with all of the last round of horrible bad weather that was there, or helping people get back on their feet that might have found themselves in a situation where they don't have a job or they might have found themselves without a home, we bring 
things that give people integrity and, and that we give people the ability to really feel good about themselves so they can get themselves back on their feet again and they can do it with pride. And so our event that's coming up uh, beginning of November, which will be at Cipriani on 42nd Street. I'm we, we all know Cipriani well. Um, you know, it's really not only a beautiful evening of coming together, but we really were storytellers. We, we love to share with everyone the great, the, the great stories of the individuals that we help. And if it can be anywhere from someone who's in the military service, it can be a single mother that's raising children on her own, or even a single father who's raising children on their own, or a grandparent. You know, it's interesting. Family today is not necessarily just the nucleus mother and father as we know. It can be two dads, two moms, a single dad, grandparents, aunts. <clears throat> so we, we really like to share with people that great story of where people found themselves in a less desirable place and how our help was able to lift them up with great integrity and, and give them pride and get them back on a road to success, not only themselves, but their families. And so it's very, it's important to me for two reasons. One, I was raised <clears throat> to always get back. Even as kids, we had <clears throat> in Seattle, there were telethons. I don't even think they do telethons anymore. And our <laughs> parents would send us out with our wagon and we would go door to door knocking, collecting a doll or a quarter and, and you bring it all together and drive it downtown and dump it into the big, you know, bin of, of cash where you could make donations on television. But it instilled in us at a very early age, <clears throat> you should always find yourself the opportunity to help those who who need help because you never know when you might need that help yourself and and i think if it's mentoring an individual in our industry if it's helping a neighbor or being able to in a big way help many many people that need that help it's it's important it, it makes us the human beings that we are and caring human beings are better human beings so Anyone that can help, certainly we would love for you to be part of the Delivering Good Gala. Join us, buy a table, buy tickets. Always happy to take not only donations of clothes or things that people can use, but also the ability to, you know, give back in a really good way. Because when you give back, it really feels good. I agree. And I hope that a lot of our viewers are able to support Delivering Good and its mission. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you, Ken. Um, I'm excited to see what's next with Halston. Um, and I will see you around New York. You, you, you are an honorary Halstonette, and I love you dearly. And I can't <laughs> wait to see you in the close. Be well, my dear. Be well. Bye. Well, I am thrilled to bring um, back on with us our editor-in-chief, William Gooch, who is going to give us some thoughts about Bridal Week, which is coming up for Fashion Bridal Week. It's my favorite. I love bridal. I've been married so long. I don't know why I still love bridal so much, but William, <laughs> welcome. Good to see you. It's great to be back. And simply, <laughs> I had to take your place last week, and I was so nervous. No, not last week. Our last, our last um, episode. I was so nervous, oh, God. but I soldiered through, and the reason I soldiered through is I remember how you do things. Oh, see, you thank are a, you. such an incredible example to help oh. me soldier through. Oh, my God! I had to be here, and I had to take your place, which I've never done before, but I don't want to do it again. <laughs> Well, I know that you were fantastic. I'm looking forward to watching the episode, um, so, but we... Anyway. You are here to talk about bridal, and that is, you know, you know it always is. You know, I'm always so romantic, and I'm always like, oh, yeah. I want to go to all the shows. I love it. So we know um, that bridal week is very different than um, regular New York Fashion Week. And mm -hmm. how did we come to start covering bridal? Well, you know, I've been in the industry about 15 years, and in the early part of my journey in fashion as a fashion editor, I would get invited to bridal shows all the time. And I was just like, okay, I'm not going. I didn't want to go. Because I kept thinking, how many white dresses can you look at? I mean, this <laughs> is a really boring experience. 
And I would just turn down the invitations or I wouldn't respond and never go. So when I started fashionreview.com, and you know, we are a daily content site, I needed content to go with our daily content motif, so to speak, or daily content um, projection. So I said, well, let me, I'm just gonna go to bridal. I'll go to two or three shows. I know I'll be bored out of my mind, but I'm gonna go write the reviews and at least we did it and it will fill up our daily content cash, so to speak. So <laughs> I went and I was blown away because when you think of bridal, which is a, something like an $8 billion industry in the United States, you always think about the typical weddings gown silhouette, you know, a princess gown, a mermaid gown, a fit and flare. Mm -hmm. now, these are all the typical silhouettes. But what you don't realize is they're all different kinds of bridal accoutrement mm -hmm. that go with a bridal gown. Mm -hmm. You have the veil, you have the men's tuxedo, you have, and all of that is included in Bridal Week. And mm -hmm. also, your, your nuptial is not just one day, it's your bridal rehearsal dinner. So you need clothes for that. Mm -hmm. You need clothes for the mother of the bride, you need clothes for the bridesmaid. Mm -hmm. So many different elements, and all that comes together during New York International Bridal Week. So when you go to Bridal Week, you get to experience that it's more than just a bridal gown. Mm -hmm. And in New York, you get to see, oh my God, so many different perspectives on a bridal gown. Right. I remember I went to Theo, which is a wonderful, wonderful ready-to-wear collection and um, brand. They also do bridal. And one year, the creative director was inspired by David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust, early 70s. So the gowns came out looking like something out of another planet. Wow. I'm going to zoom to the planet Xenon or something. <laughs> and you were like, what the? Well, <laughs> ham sandwich is this? But it was sexy. It was hot. It was futuristic. Yeah. So it's more than what people think. It is so much fun, so glamorous. And our former guest, Ken Downing, talked about how glamour is so important part of fashion. Yeah. It's a, definitely a part of Bridal Fashion Week. And Absolutely. you're going to be with me this season. I know. At the show. I and know. And we're going to have a lot of fun. Oh, my God. We're going to have so much fun. Okay. So of the shows, what shows are we looking forward to this bridal okay. season? Okay. I'm looking forward to the Badgley Mishka, which I've never been to their bridal before, mm -hmm. um, show. And we're going together, Cicely. They have a, br a breakfast. So they're going to feed us and entertain us. So I I'm excited. It. Love it. And I'm looking forward to Sachin and Bobby, who I love. I Nancy Santo, who I love. Um, I believe Jimmy Chu has come out with a bridal collection, and we've been mm -hmm. excited. So I'm looking forward to that to see what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. So those are my top four. But I'm sure invitations are still coming in, so I don't have everything organized yet. Sure. Now, who would you say just every year you think are consistently your very top bridal designers um, and well, why? Well, out, out, of, out of the, you know, I Nancy Sancho hits it out of the park every year. I'm talking about glamour, glamour. And to give you one example, one year she held her bridal show at Jazz at Lincoln Center with a full symphony orchestra playing. Wow. While we were served wow. champagne. Wow. With the windows opened up, the curtains opened up in the back, and you could see Central Park as the as the bridal models walked across the stage. That's the level of Inez Di Santo. It's like a couture, a Paris couture show. It really is. So I look Ooh. forward to her. Yeah. I look forward to Sachin and Bob because they do very contemporary pieces that brides want to wear right now, so it could be a jumpsuit, it could be a pantsuit, it could be a cute little cocktail bridal dress. You know, they don't create clothes just for that bride in her first wedding. It could be their bride's third wedding. So it's a lot of variety that I love, and it's always seen through the lens of unbelievable um, modernity and elegance. And 
You know, what would Bridal Week be without Naeem Khan? I mean, come on. Naeem mm -hmm. Khan. Hello. I was there last year, and at the end of the show, he walked out and he jumped up and down and said, we're back. Oh. Because we've been so, you know, suppressed because of COVID. Yeah. So his shows are always beautiful, always wonderful, always has a Halston 70s vibe. Remember, he worked as a designer under Halston, with Halston. Oh. So you see that aesthetic always in his collections. Yeah. yeah. Excited. So oh. I'm excited about, about Bridal Week. It is October the 11th through the 14th. And Fashion Rarity will be there front and center doing all most of the bridal shows. And we're also going to have some video coverage that we're going to put on our new TikTok channel. So you guys know where to go. Thank you, William, so much. I cannot wait to come to all the shows. I hope they all have champagne because that's my favorite thing to drink. And next year is going to be my 10th anniversary. So maybe I have to have a big party for myself and wear another wedding dress. We'll see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cicely. Thank you so much. Thank you, William. Well, viewers, that's it for this episode of Fashion Reverie Talks. We would like to thank our guests, Ken Downing and William Gooch. For information on these and other stories, go to fashionreverie.com. Thanks for watching, you guys. We'll see you the next time.